Uh, welcome to CDHI's first lightning lunch of this academic year, Game Studies and uh, the Purpose of Play. So thank you, especially to my colleagues, uh, Betsy uh, Moss, who's helped put this together today, and my predecessor, Khan Bo, who uh, found our participants and has brought this group together. My name is Chloe Bordwick. Uh, I am the Digital Humanities Postdoctoral Fellow at the Jackman Humanities Institute and at CDHI uh, here at U of T. And I'm going to facilitate the discussion today. Uh, now on to our wonderful panelists um, who um, we're lucky to be joined by today. First up, we'll have Phelan Parker, who's Associate Professor at St. Michael's College at U of T and co-PI on the Swarming Comic Con Shirk Insight Grant. His research interests include media industries and cultures with a specific focus on games, digital media, and film. Today, Phelan's presentation, Game Studies and or Digital Humanities, will look at different ways we can study games, how game studies and digital humanities or DH work together, as well as they, where they might productively diverge. Uh, and we're going to share a uh, link to his book uh, in the chat, Beyond the Sea, Navigating Bioshock, edited volume. Next up, we have Christine Tran, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Information. And their research interests include cultural studies of live video platforms, media studies, and game studies. Christine's contribution to the panel today, entitled Feminist Game Studies for Academic Community Defense in Unfun Times, will address how playing from a feminist perspective, drawing from Shira Chess, can aid in unlearning or learning our assumptions about the emancipatory potential of DH tools and in developing alternative networks of solidarity during unfun times. And they are currently a CDHI graduate fellow. Uh, which uh, we hope some of you here today may be interested uh, in pursuing as an opportunity as well. And finally, uh, last but not least up, we'll have uh, Shanmuga Priyati, who's a digital humanities postdoctoral scholar at the Department of Historical and Cultural Studies here. Her expertise lies in building and applying digital technologies for historical and literary research with a specific focus on text mining, digital mapping, and digital creative visualizations. Her presentation today, Critical Making of Contemporary Information Through Digital Born Creative Works, uh, is going to examine digital born creations and their media styles to dissect current societal challenges uh, and spotlight uh, student selected works with gaming elements. So that's enough of me um, to read more. You can read more about all of them on our website. Um, you have fuller bios, but uh, for the moment, I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, uh, Phelan, and you should be able to share your slides. I'm going to stop my share. As was mentioned, my training is in film communication and media studies. Um, I've been working in and around game studies for the better part of 15 years at this point, including running a couple of game studies scholarly groups and associations and organizing conferences. And I mentioned this because it gives you a good sense of a field to do that kind of thing. Um, seeing all the proposals, hanging out with people, um, you know, I, ha I have a bit of a read on at least my little corner of kind of Canadian critical game studies. Game studies is a slippery term that describes an expansive uh, interdisciplinary field of study originating primarily in English comparative literature, film studies, media studies, sociology, and science and technology studies, but also intersecting with many other fields, including, of course, digital humanities. Um, the field critically examines game texts, players, cultures, and industries of all kinds through a wide variety of perspectives, although it has historically emphasized digital games. Not all game-related research is categorized under the umbrella of game studies, um, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but it's a little bit like media studies that way. So computer science and human-computer interaction, game design, psychology, and economic game theory, for example, have their own professional networks, their own conferences, their own journals for game research that only sometimes overlap with game studies. 
all that to say game studies is a messy and promiscuous field that acts a lot more like a discipline than it is, uh, you, you know, even if it's technically not a discipline. Um, and in this sense, it is not unlike DH, right? So today I'm going to share some half-baked thoughts and questions about the relationship between game studies and DH that have been lurking in the back of my mind for some time. I want to reflect on the blurry boundaries, the productive overlaps, and the equally productive divergences between these two fields, with a particular emphasis on method and professionalization. Now, right off the bat, I must confess that I do not consider my work to be digital humanities. Uh, I think of myself as a media scholar who specializes in games and media industries. I'm not very familiar with the central concerns, debates, and approaches of DH, and I have not sought to position myself or my work as DH professionally. So mine is an outsider perspective, um, and the goal is to raise some hopefully interesting questions for us all to think about. Now, in spite of this, as someone who studies digital games, I have often found myself invited to join DH events and networks, much like this one. And while I'm always happy to participate, I never quite know how to, to navigate my status as an honorary DH scholar. Um, even preparing for today's discussion, I've been anxious, I am anxious, about putting my foot in my mouth or accidentally reopening some long settled debate in my ignorance of DH. And so apologies in advance if I do that. Here's an example of this sort of funny, this funny status that I've, that I've experienced around DH. So a few years ago, I was invited to a meeting about setting up a new DH lab in a library. And I sort of nodded along with my brilliant colleagues as they discussed all kinds of amazing potential resources and projects that could be included in such a lab. And eventually someone asked me to weigh in. They asked me, what would you do with a data visualization wall? And I genuinely had no clue what to say. I, I had only the vaguest notion of what a data, data visualization wall was, let alone how I would use one in my research or teaching. It was simply not the kind of work that I was interested in doing, had no experience with it whatsoever. And so I sort of dissembled and kind of was like, oh, look, I got no, I have no idea. And the response to my ambivalence was a kind and generous one. Uh, my more DH savvy colleagues were sort of telling me, don't sell yourself short. Of course, your work is DH. It's a big tent. But even a big tent has walls, however permeable those walls might be. And when I say my work isn't DH in contexts like this, I'm not being modest, right? I have theoretical, methodological, and professional commitments that have led me to align myself with other fields. And so moments like this crystallize a question for me about the limits of interdisciplinarity. There is, without question, like we can take for granted that there is a wide range of amazing scholarship happening in the kind of Venn diagram overlap between game studies and DH. My co-panelists will demonstrate this, and I can share other examples in the discussion later of, of work that I think is, is cool and interesting happening in a sort of DH-inflected game studies or a game studies-inflected DH. But nevertheless, just as not all work in DH is game studies, not all game studies research and not all work on digital media more generally is digital humanities. Um, and I think we need to make intentional choices about the methods and disciplines that we mobilize, whether discursively or actually you know, practically in our research and really think about what are the right tools for the job. For game scholars, sometimes the answer to that question lies in DH frameworks and sometimes it's elsewhere as I found myself. As Anastasia Salter and Mel Stanfield have recently argued in a great article about the relationship between DH and uh, game studies, it's important to think about the labor, the economic and environmental impacts of DH projects. Um, and they sort of argue that game studies has some, some good lessons for, for thinking about those impacts. And so I also wonder, as I'm thinking about these disciplinary questions, I wonder about the costs of dis interdisciplinarity when it comes to professionalization, um, particularly for grad students and early career scholars doing game studies research. Because game studies is itself highly interdisciplinary, it remains important for aspiring game scholars to ground themselves in a home discipline, media studies in my case, because there are still few opportunities to study or work in a dedicated game studies department. And so this means that DH is potentially a third shift that aspiring game scholars may feel compelled to take on. 
And I wonder, is it sustainable to study, read, teach, attend conferences, publish, make creative work, apply for jobs and pursue grants and so on and so forth across two, three or more different interdisciplinary fields? We know how endemic precarity, overwork and burnout is in academia and how scholars marginalized on the basis of race, class, gender, sexuality and ability are disproportionately impacted by these issues. Um, and I worry that the, the, the impulse to maximize interdisciplinarity runs counter to you know, notions of slow scholarship and, and taking better care of ourselves and our communities as academics. So I want to be clear that in raising these questions, I'm not calling for strict disciplinary boundaries or gatekeeping or silos, right? I'm thinking more about the decisions that individual researchers make about how to mobilize different frameworks that are available to them. What is important to me is precision about scholarly methods, right? The right tools for the right job and care for the scholars who are doing the work, right? Whether talking about game studies or DH or the productive overlap between them. And so in other words, just as we're asking what the purpose of play is in game studies and DH, I think we should also be asking what is the purpose of interdisciplinarity in game studies and DH? So thanks for listening. I look forward to uh, thinking more about these questions with my co-panelists and the audience in the discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, Chris, Christine, um, you're up next. Thanks. Delightful. Let me get my wares on the screen because this was of course today, the, my double screen arrangement decided to malfunction, but you know what? Thank you for addressing the messiness, Phelan, and establishing a precedent for messiness, both in practice and in theory, because today, uh, can y'all see the screen? All right. Perfect. So thank you so much, Phelan, again, for entering this from the messiness, because uh, today's I'm I'm entering like Phelan. I position myself first as a digital media scholar and media industry scholars, particularly in live streaming. And this talk today titled Feminist Game Studies for Scholarly Community Defense and Unfun Times, I've decided to make perhaps should just be abbreviated uh, fun, but at what cost? And I arrive at these shared challenges that Phelan has articulated between DH and games from three dimensions for my own research namely player communities, the platforms they occupy, and this notion of uh, pink collar labor, rather the activities we in the vernacular that we describe as women's work, you know, think of the things enclosed in the domestic space, cooking, cleaning, caring, and the day I argue in my research and today, uh, and, and a, a proposition that we think of this enclave where many of us are broadcasting right now, the domestic, uh, we, I want to ask how the domestic and the house can be taken seriously as a shared site, not just in digital play culture, but DH, and I'm mobilizing this a uh, lot of my work in live streaming spaces to do so. So when we think of like digital homework, you might think as we are in, as we remain in an ongoing pandemic, uh, like headlines around Zoom and the use of webcams in the home, like we are on today. And I want to return to this like posture that doesn't necessarily seem gamer, but <laughs> this type of gamer's posture at the table before a webcam and the the both the Zoom figure user and the gamer as this gatekeeper between the mess of quote real life as you see in this popular this famous cover from the New Yorker from 2020 and the quote fun the stage of the web as portrayed uh, on the left and both what the both the New Yorker and the Wired headline have here this popular have in common and this popular imagination uh, is drawing from this language of streaming and play during the pandemic to help people make sense of like our network lives so decades after Alvin Toffler coined electronic cottage uh, to depict the confluence of information tech like printers and phones and computers in the home. I want to think about how the sites of play and labor in our field feel ever both like ever proximate, but also high pressured and the demand of, against these institutional struggles that Phelan also occupied. And I want to chart like where is the digital humanity outlined in this like electronic playground. Uh, and during the pandemic, we see the we saw the influence of uh, games cultures as politicians like AOC, Jack Meatsani, and even Joe Biden looked to games media as a means to replace this, these moments of in-person communication. And yet, as of course, I want to address today as a feminist game scholar, how the legacy of news and play as a public aggregator is fraught. Not everybody plays the same, and the sites of convergence of leisure for some populations are site of exclusions and pain for others. And while we are not all politicians looking to, you know, 
know, please our constituents with gaming platforms. We all, however, politically constituted by these means of production. And I want to ask like, what DH and particularly feminist game studies can learn from their shared genealogies. So to position this, when I position myself as a feminist game scholar, I'm not just, uh, it's not just the study of girls and games, as Nina Huntman put it, but the study of how gender, it's an intersection with race, class, and sexuality is produced, represented, and consumed and put to work by digital games. And I'm citing, I cited the same article that Phelan mentioned in his talk by Salter and Blogged it, where they looked at the shared genealogies in terms of public scholarship between DH and feminist game studies, and how both our practices as DH scholars publishing, publishing and sharing research overlap with the ascent of information technologies and particularly shared genealogies of the rise of Twitter, which brings up which brings another fraught history we have to consider at this intersection of Gamergate. A lot of the work I do studying marginalized gamer communities and live streaming is done under the shadow of this what Adrian Maserani terms the long harassment event, where social networking tools in Gamergate were used to police, harass, dox, and threaten famous game industry figures, and how these results reflect how play and its purpose are not inherently benevolent forces. Uh, Gamergate weaponized the narrative that gaming was for a specific set of people and other people were killjoys ruining fun as cause rationale to inflict digital and often uh, so in-person violence against not only developers and critics, but scholars scholars themselves within that overlap between the feminist media and DH and game space. And these tactics range used uh, information and learning technology tools that many of us use every day. I'm citing, of course, uh, Shira Tress and Adrian Shaw wrote about how a public Google Doc at a conference was a site of vandalism for Gamergate trolls to target feminist game scholars. And we can kind of see that ascent today towards, uh, sorry, the information tools that continue to populate our, your desk drive. I think there's this type of genealogy that can be mapped between those like anti-feminist gamer disruption events to the ascent of Zoom bombs in 2020, as I've written about. And uh, as a colleague, my colleague Melanti Hewa and I depicted behind me in that picture there have also written about how this content created this mode to present everything as public scholarship to extend our app or use technology tools to amplify research also positions the scholar as a type of content creator with all the precarities that entails. And uh, so an ethic, so like multi-platform game studies can be a way to recognize the affinities between DH and other scholars with other multi-platform content creators, be they game streamers, journalists, pornographers, or even uh, writers, and for whom success begins neither with the gaming of like algorithms and visibility or network or policy changes, but on the ground level, rather it begins with like their work begins with this gaming of authenticity and its affordance and affordances and the pressure to build affinities between themselves and communities that feel real enough to see returns and follow subscriptions and other ties, monetized metrics or reputation. DH tools, maps, websites, and other publication, digital modes of publication uh, provide discrete units of feedback that are not exempt from these visibility systems. So a brief overview of the case study I used, Twitch, uh, li we don't often position this as an academic tool, but they, there were people I knew that looked to live streaming media to extend their uh, communication practice or live, recreate again, like the, like AOC, like <laughs> or Jagmeet sign those moments of live community connection and even took teaching to Twitch. But there also needs to be reconsider how these uh, use of gaming technologies in DH might recreate these uh, precarious labor uh, conditions. And at the same time, recognizing that Twitch and like these tools open up modes of accessibility, like uh, Twitch, for example, you know, when you're streaming from home where I am now, I know where the bathroom bathrooms are, I know where the exits are, my risk of being followed into those bathrooms by someone I don't know is at a minimum. And uh, looking at these shared genealogies about how marginalized people present themselves in this space is what I've been working on and looking at and how these gaming tools often provide uh, what I call like a dimmer switch and enter new modes of autonomy, uh, Give what just as these tools give uh, marginalized gamers new modes at of autonomy and how to calibrate the opacity between themselves, autonomy or how to present themselves, we also find themselves snared in the visibility traps whereby the use of information technologies for the extraction of fun of others is not a bug, but a feature of the design. And to quote to my colleague Stephanie Fisher's GDC talk, uh, up in the games industry, men are often 
positioned as having fun, where women have to be fun. And it's often these legacies that reverberate throughout our use of information technologies. And I didn't talk too much about community defense here, but there's many, I listed here a few groups that are currently using these same tools in the game space to consider social change, not just in the context of gaming themselves, but uh, across the technology industry. Uh, feminine, feminine, uh, Anita Sarkeesian, uh, one of the targets of Gamergate was the founder of Feminist Frequency, and as a result of the anti-gamer harassment, has one of the founders of the anti-gaming gaming harassment hotline, as well as there's the, during Twitch, we saw the ascent of the Black Girl Gamer platform, which wasn't just a Twitch-centric channel to promote Black women gamers, but now has become like a multi-platform, multi network mentorship a community to educate and like provide mutual community support for black women across technology and entertainment so i just want to a little over time and leave this provocation of the to recognize how this dh publication practices are often playful ones and we might consider how these technologies also invite pain and struggle and non-fun for others and what can and by learning to be new type of gamers perhaps the worst gamers can we create a more reparative form of fun through our tools and I'd like to thank you so much for your time as we sit with that. Thanks so much, Christine, and for leaving us also with some questions to ponder kind of as we um, as we listen to our third speaker, uh, Shamo. Take it away. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I hope I am audible to everyone. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, unlike my uh, panelists, other co-panelists, I have to apologize for not being game studies scholar because I come from a digital humanities background with the literature and the history as my specialization. Um, but I look at games as kind of a digital born creative work that I use for my research and teaching as well. I look at games, particularly a kind of serious game, uh, how we can use it for teaching and other kind of educational related steps, and also how we can use it as a kind of a methodology uh, for conveying something like uh, for digital humanities projects. So with that, I'm going to start. Uh, I have been working in electronic literature since from 2014. Um, uh, but uh, what is electronic literature? So electronic literature uses, adopts the capabilities of computational other network and other network technologies. However, this kind of definition have, uh, has been evolving based on the uh, changes in the te digital technologies field and also how writers or artists, how they use some kind of new elements in, uh, through digital uh, technologies in their work. So based on that, the recent uh, definition, which, uh, which has been published in Electronic Literature Collection Volume 4, um, actually they, they actually broadly define how a digital electronic literature definition has been changed and evolving every other times. For example, I highlighted some of the interesting uh, definitions here. So electronic literature works to some degree or another incorporate three particular features. First one is literary qualities co-produced by human and algorithmic interaction. And the second one is formal and or conceptual innovation. And the third one is transforming experience for readers through um, expressive algorithms. So I'm not going to di discuss the definitions of electronic literature, but my intention is to show how this field has blurred the boundaries between many areas. For example, we, we can take a look at um, the electronic literature volume four, where you could see many genres, many new genres um, categorized. They also have a genre, games uh, categorized uh, games categorized as serious games as genres as you can see i hope you can see the screen also they have categorized as literary game also they are categorized as volumes games
okay so i'm missing some uh, terms spelling okay anyway my uh, my intention is to share that how electronic literature has uh, yes much more it, it becomes much more interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary um so in this case how i look at uh, electronic literature or in this case digital born creative works uh, and, the, and the connection between digital humanities and digital born creative works so digital born creative works can be can be used as an instrumental approach to for widening the praxis and output of the digital humanities projects so in this case i can provide many uh, recent scholarship even the electronic the annual conference of electronic literature organization this time they the, the theme the, the main theme of the conference is about uh, how we can use electronic literature for the social societal challenges and other issues so here's scott at work and rodrick cover highlight the same like how we can use electronic literature and media art or in this case digital born creative works which provide new tool sets for processing the significant shifts from the digital town to the anthropocene mass extinction that are defining our contemporary society and our, our relation to the plant so instead of going to the many review of literature here i'm going to directly jump into what i did what i'm doing currently so in my research i also use electronic literature as kind of a methodology one of the methods of digital humanities um to study water bodies the transformation water transformation of water bodies from uh, british colonial india to present particularly looking at one region in south india it's called coimbatore so in this i actually um created a digital born creative work by using the research outcomes such as field visit notes the interviews of the elders from the villages also a literary and historical resources where i collected some information about the water bodies so then um i used some of the like uh, i used some software and html javascript i tried with the help of some computational computer scientist i have to create them here as well like dhanush and magnapriya they helped me so much to create this work i'm i'm going to maybe show a little bit uh, how i incorporated gaming elements as well in that suddenly the escape button is not working so okay now it's working um so you could see the screen um where you can see actually i incorporated some poems as well it has been written in both tamil that that's the regional language also in english so i actually created this work particularly thinking about sharing this work in local schools and colleges to create awareness about water bodies the local water bodies so i didn't focus on much critical gaming uh, features because i am also very new to this kind of creativity work uh, so i started with very simple uh, but much more effective way of uh, creating this one so that i can impress and attract some school students to talk about the issue of water bodies for example if someone clicks the poem they can read the poem both in tamil and english and if someone clicks details they can also read the information that i collected or throughout my research so when i click poem so you have to play a little bit collecting the drops of water so that then only you can see the poem so it's it's actually just 10 times so this i worked with uh, core developers to decide how it should be very slow or speed how i can use this so it's very much i actually i'm still learning how we can use some of the features to create this kind of work and convey this information to others um so i it's very much very simple currently but i'm hoping to to do some more little more better work next time um so this another issue in this work uh, i actually used um, university's wordpress site uh, but it's working very well in my system because if this is created by using so many software and other programming languages so we had to embed this one along with wordpress uh, features so i can see this very much working in my system because it's locally stored but no one can access this kind of clear when in their system because it it got so disrupted because of the uh, because of the wordpress that did not allow any kind of outside elements to function in their wordpress environment 
So this is kind of a topic to discuss um, because I have been working with this even Matt is here. I hope he knows that we have been discussing about this kind of issue even for our current work. I'm uh, for my current supervisor, uh, Bhavani Raman's work. We have been discussing about this issue. Um, so maybe this is another uh, topic of discussion. So I'm moving back to my um, work. So okay, then. Uh, what I did, um, based on my research and based on my experience I received throughout all these years in digital humanities and digital literature, so I created this course called Critical uh, Making of Contemporary Information through Digital Born Creative Works. So for this, I borrowed some of the concepts and terms from scholars Matt Rato and Anastasia Salter and Jason Hillman. So what is critical making? This term and concept introduced by Matt Rato in 2008 at the University of Toronto. This is uh, specifically for studying the technology, whether it's the advantages and disadvantages, but it has much more common with uh, design and art practice. So then uh, the other concept I borrowed from Anastasia and Salt, Anastasia Salter and Jason Hillman is kind of how we can convert or transform our scholarship into through sorry into playful, experiential, public, and interactive and weird uh, by using some. Uh, languages. For example, I attended their course uh, 2000, at 2022. Um, they used Tresri and P5 to teach uh, how we can, can uh, transform our scholarship into more interactive uh, components. So I actually uh, adopted all these concepts and ideas for my course as well. So when I uh, look at critical making um, from the perspective of digital born creative works as uh, it's, it's a way of drawing connections between thinking and conceptualizing contemporary critical information through digital creative construction. Such critical makings through creative coding are applied for both literary and non-literary context. For this, um, in, our, in my class, we looked at both, uh, we, we looked at many resources, for example, electronic, digital, electronic literature collection volumes uh, and also COVID-19 elite exhibition which is hosted by uh, Electronic Literature Organization in, the, in their annual conference, and also Chapter, which publishes a computational literary pieces. So particularly filtered themes, kind of you know, digital cultural industry, environmental challenges, and COVID-19 pandemic. And we looked at the works in different ways, for example, what kind of technologies they used, what kind of societal challenges, what are the literary and non-literary aesthetics, and how, how it is accessible, the access of the uh, works and how we, one can read because digital literacy is also something very much important. So we actually, basically we analyzed all the works and at the end of the course, I also taught Twine for the students to create some kind of creative works to address some of their, select, their own selected topics. And they actually, they did really pretty good job. I'm really proud of them. They actually, I actually collected all of their works and hosted my, hosted on in my website, uh, anyone can access that. I'm going to show one or two works here. Uh, the first one is Post Pandemic uh, by Jyoki Han and uh, Han Tan. Um, they, they created by using Figma because though I, although I taught Twine, they come up with their own um, you know, experience in their, in their comfortable technology uh, they wanted to choose. So this one is very simple that it, there is no words to explain anything except three keywords. It's about the post pandemic suffocated invaded distance. So one can click the suffocated and can see the mask. A little bit some music. I'm, I, I am not sure whether you could hear the music. Uh, then just click the exit button and then invade it. Um, it's a it's little uh, kind of you know, complicated design, but it's it's very interesting one. So you, one can interpret in many ways about the experience of post pandemic impact. And the next one is about the lockdown. So they, they dissect how they feel felt about the lockdown. So they created these kinds of very interesting design elements. Uh, one can play with that. Um, I'm going to show you another uh, interesting one. Um, there is one game, okay. This one, uh, this one by uh, by Yan Shong, he created this uh, game uh, by using just simply twine. It's about the mental health, uh, ADHD, uh, that it's about how one can 
feel if they have this kind of you know uh, deficiency so uh, using this twine one can play the entire twine and find out uh, the experience of adhd and um, okay i think i'm i may run out of time so i'm going to stop here but um, i'm glad to show you any more works if you well, if you are interested to see this, to see all of these works um, so themes I, I just divided the themes that my students used impact, impact of post pandemic and environmental issues political and societal challenges and digital cultural industry and also mental health um, that's it i'm going to stop here thank you so much Thank you. Um, thank you. It was great to see those specific examples of the work that your students have done. Because I'm sure many of us here are interested also in how we can apply these insights in our own teaching or in the classroom. So um, that was really wonderful. And I think as a whole, we've seen here how across all three of our speakers and kind of what's at stake in, in the choice of certain kinds of methods, um, ethically or otherwise, and, and in what conversations we choose to be a part of, where we position ourselves either as scholars or even as gamers or people who have fun, um, people who pursue leisure in the world. So I wanna open it up for questions. We still have 20 minutes um, and I know there we have a great crowd today, um, large crowd. So um, if anyone, would like to ask a question, um, can raise your hand um, or put it into the the chat, um, whatever you're more comfortable with. I can jump in myself here, but I just want to make sure everyone has an opportunity um, to speak. I mean, I think I'll, I'll ask the first question here and then um, uh, other folks, I'm sure, um, have things to ask as well. Um, as someone who's not a gamer myself, I've put that out there. I'm definitely also not in game studies. This is really interesting for me, um, as I said, partly from the perspective of a, of teaching. Um, but you know, many people in our audience here are uh, maybe coming from uh, DH, but gaming curious, um, interested in kind of what insight they, um, you know, what what could they, what sort of one thing, what's a point of entry, let's say, um, for um, DH scholars or students um, looking to explore um, gaming kind of within their own work. And I think, um, Shen, you spoke to this uh, uh, partly on a, a, a really useful practical level, like twine as a point of entry where, you know, that's something that even students can work with. But I'm wondering also, um, if there are other methodological points of entry, or if there's sort of one big insight you would like, um, DH people who don't know that much about gaming to take away, um, either Phelan or Christine or Sean Moen, anyone free to jump in. And then I see we have questions coming from the audience as well. Can jump in as people collect their thoughts. Um, I mean, part of me wants to just say, you know, just kind of jump into it directly, right? Just like put some games on your syllabus, um, maybe, you know, ask students for suggestions. Um, there's lots of resources out there, I think, to to sort of help figure that in. Um, our colleague here at U of T, Adam Hammond, has a lot of twine um, kind of tutorials on his website. Um, he, he does twine in one of his English courses. Um, even, I think even, you know, I, I have done limited things like this, but in the past, in, in some of the earlier game studies courses that I taught, I did little twine workshops and it is like shockingly easy to get off the ground. You can go very far with it. You know, it's an easy to learn, hard to master sort of thing, but um, it's not as intimidating as, as you might think. Um, in terms of sort of getting exposure into the field, um, a book that I really like that I actually use as a textbook for a first year seminar that I teach on game studies is How to Play Video Games, edited by Matthew Thomas Payne and Nina Hunteman, who was the latter of which was cited in Christine's panel. Um, and it's a great book because it's made up of short, like 1,000, 1,500 word chapters on a specific concept paired with a specific game. And so it gives you a very teachable collection of ideas and concepts. But I think even just for familiarizing yourself with the field and some of the sort of canonical texts and, and, and a few non-canonical texts as well, I think it's a really useful resource. 
Great. Thank you for those very concrete suggestions. Christine. Yeah. yeah. And on the flip side of Phelan, thank you for laying out like teaching and methodological tools and resources, because I was also holding what I'm holding what Chloe said about not identifying as a gamer. And I'm really interested in that question of what can classes do. I'm really interested in what we can do as scholars to like move around those often very class, very gendered boundaries of what we dis dis what we qualify as games and who is gamers. Um, because I, I think like, you know, yet these popular images of the number one game in the world perhaps is like this year would be like Baldur's Gate or last year Elden Ring. But in practice, if you by what metric, like by <laughs> are we counting like mobile games or or, or card games, board games? and continuing to expand, I think, the work, even if we can do in your classroom, even if you are not a games classroom, even a media classroom, is to continue uh, questioning by whose boundaries are we delimiting that notion of games and how are certain like preconceptions and biases, as much as that board bias is very fraught, <laughs> can be approached very fraughtly. Uh, who do we count as play, uh, as playing games and uh, uh, that's yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, thank you. Um, I know Igor has a Sokolov has a question too. Shanmu, did you want to um, also respond to that question? I just wanted to say that um, so uh, from the from the, because I come from the digital literature, so I have only suggestions for that. But uh, you can use digital literature because some of the works in that uh, they have gaming elements, but. If you look at the literary field, some of the terms like read, but that got changed when it comes to digital literature because we don't, we don't, we no longer say just read, we just say interact, play, view, because all those terms are also connected with the game studies. So if we if we choose some of the cre digital creative works, you can we can ask students to find out what kind of gaming elements they feel in their narrative, because most of the time we just play, we have to interact. It's also like moving around the same concept with the games as well so yeah that's all from me thank you that that's really uh, that's wonderful thought thank you uh igor uh sokolov yeah hello uh can you hear me yes we hear you yeah sorry uh like sorry for not having a camera i just like don't have like using mobile internet now which makes it a bit, a bit harder so uh like uh, I have like a more like almost like a practical question. I'm a PhD student in anthropology and I want to like bring in like video games as a method in the anthropology as like uh, trying to replicate like ethnographic experiences in a video game so that like instead of somebody reading ethnography, they can like the play uh, like as a part of the community you've been studying or something like that to like understand it like from a like first person perspective almost. And I wonder, like, uh, like I'm just like st studying my PhD, and I wonder, like, uh, within Year of T, uh, uh, where <laughs> can I like look for allies, like, to try to do something like that? And uh, is it like possible to like uh, get a grant to like hire somebody to like do the programming for this kind of game, or should I like try to uh, do all the programming myself? Because yeah, that's like not something that's plausible at the moment. <laughs> As far as how we handle responses, I think just any panelist, you know, feel free to jump in. So I guess my my gut response is like that's that sounds expensive and labor intensive, right? Um, I just shared a link in the chat uh, for a great book about doing ethnography in virtual worlds, which is more about doing ethnography in like popular, you know, in, like commercial virtual worlds and MMOs and things like that, but might be useful as you're thinking through these questions. And then the other thing I was going to point you to is a project by um, Katrina Kiefer at Trent, um, who is doing, I think she's a historian by training, I believe, but she's in the cultural studies department, um, but she's doing a pretty incredible project recreating Bunce Island in Sierra Leone um, in conjunction with locals. Um, it's a, it's an island that has a very, a great significance in the transatlantic slave trade, and they're using the Unreal Engine to create like a hyper kind of photorealistic uh, version of the space that can be explored, which sounds maybe a little bit in line with the kind of thing 
that you're imagining. So I would say, look to the parallel examples to start, see what people are already doing in this kind of vein, and then talk to them about it. Ask them how much it cost and how many people they needed for their team and you know what disasters they encountered on the way. I also had a suggestion and I was also, go I'm also going to share a resource. I remembered uh, this might approach like archaeology from a different way than you were imagining, Igor, but I was thinking about how when we want to make these disciplinary like reaches between like, for example, archaeology and immersive gaming, I would like really encourage, like, I hope we would enter these collaborations wanting to teach and give each other uh, things and like what could like, not just what could like critical game studies learn from archaeology, but I have I'm be very intrigued with the question of what archaeology could learn from like the specific methodological and theoretical questions framed by game studies. And I found this resource about actually using, you know, an archive this what resource that archives every game where the character the main character is an archaeologist or archaeological approaches could be used to map the game world. Like in this case, yeah, fict virtual fictional worlds it would be an interesting starting point to develop like a, a shared research question you have with the uh, field. Um, Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ho hopefully that answers your question. We also have a, we have two more questions um, in the queue here. One from uh, Isabella, who um, I who, who I will read, which whose question I'll read out loud, and then we have I think Mitchell uh, next up. So here's the question uh, from the participant: How do you deal with the narrative of gamification in your approaches to teaching game studies or in critically analyzing game media? Uh, how does it complicate disciplinarity? Because the ideas of game design and gameplay have leaked so far outside uh, their traditional boundaries. If you need a few seconds also to compose a response, feel free, but um, I see Christine. Because I'm looking up the name of the article, and again, I'm not like I'm. I don't want to make like a firm stance, but it's called like Jamie Woodcock's article, "Gamification and How to Stop It." Uh, I tend to because I'm like you know from a field of like critical political economists, and for them, yeah, gamification is like a byword for things like uh, you know excel uh, for a mode of as this question might signify a lot of new forms of like exploitation and hyper acceleration of labor routines. And I'm not taking like a using this platform to take a firm stance either way on it, but that was a reason the first resource that came to my mind. And perhaps I could be I could also begin with like recognizing how yeah I think this question also acknowledges a lot of our interfaces in the academy are already so gamified today, right down to Quirkus allowing you to you know survey your hours and minutes spent on the platform and modify an avatar and. Uh, yeah, recognize. I think like a game of a, a critical approach to gamification might recognize how it's not like something that is all far off in the future and will be accelerated with all these AI technologies that are proliferating, but perhaps a, you know pre-told by certain practices we're already enacting today. And I will find the article to put in the chat soon. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Um, would either of the other Phelan or Shanmu do you want to reply to that as well? Shanmu, do you have something? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't apologize. So yeah, I mean, gamification comes up a lot. When I first got my job as a media studies prof at St. Mike's, my boss at the time, who who was great, love him dearly, but like he kept referring to what I did as gamification and it drove me crazy because it's not at all what I do, right? And gamification is the sort of like, you know, mobilization of game-like things to uh, basically for behavioral modification, right? Um, and there's, as Christine alluded to, there's huge amounts of debate and discourse about this. Um, I actually, just by coincidence, uh, the most recent episode of the fantastic podcast Game Studies Study Buddies, which I would also recommend to anyone in DH who's interested in game studies. It's basically just long form discussions about books from game studies. Um, but their most recent episode was from a book called Adrian uh, by Adrian Hahn called You've Been Played, which is sort of more of a journalistic book, not so much academic, but very much draws on the academic research. And it's basically a pretty systematic critique of the way that gamification 
stopped we sort of stopped noticing it as much and yet it kind of persists everywhere or we stopped calling it that quite so much um but we, as christine pointed out right the sort of platformization of everything um the metricification of everything um very clearly has precedence in game design um or like particular patterns in game design um and and for sure deserves uh sustained and ongoing critique i think uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Mitchell, uh, I think you were next in the in the lineup. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks for addressing some of the elephants in the room with gamification. I'm a big fan of gamification. I use it a lot in my personal life. I try and incorporate as much things as I can. However, all of the critiques that you gave are incredibly valid and the things I hate about gamification that people try and do with it. So with me, and I try and do very different ways for it, but that's just an aside. I just want to say thank you for addressing that because it's a very complicated term that people are using very liberally on in a lot of ways. But basically, my question would be, with game studies, I see a lot of people focusing a lot of their game studies more on digital content. I guess asking a bunch of people in digital humanities would probably not be necessarily the best people to ask for this, but I think you'd give a very good perspective on this. Uh, why do you think that there is not as much focus on physical, so tabletop gaming, board games, card games, as you'll see quite a bit attention towards digital games and some towards uh, role-playing games? I can provide perspective almost like there's a parallel narrative again within feminist game studies about why when you know feminist game scholars that can be frank here are writing grants and trying to give them matters why does it matter to study games from the perspective of the creation of a like, gender and class identity uh, a through way to make it matter in public discourse is arguing well games are like the beta grounds to get girls interested in STEM and we need more women in STEM and, and, and I'm holding that argument true a lot of a uh, young woman's introductory exclusions to the idea that women can't be engineers can't be astronauts can't be technicians begins with you can't play this like no this console's for your brother it's for the boys it's not for you and similarly I think uh, a lot because we live I hate the world in a digital world if I can use that like a lot lot of the interactions we've had, our social commons have been poached by digital apparatuses. And perhaps uh, it is more easily to recognize through games, you can more people who are not gamers or game scholars can more easily recognize intersection points of their interest through digital game studies. Not that those uh, connection points and those pressing urgent mat urgent questions of inclusion can't be raised in things like, for sure, tabletop games or card games or analog games. But I think uh, we're just living in a particularly, like the, the times are perhaps the answer to why like digital uh, digital studies has such supremacy. And I also, like, I know we're coming to the end, like, yeah, love to unpack that you entered this question to the terms of content, because to me, content uh, is like so aligned with a particular mode of like information that is meant to be circulated and shared and perhaps even like commodified and viewed as part of your broader portfolio as a public writer or content creator. And Again, that type of, I think through the mechanisms of digital technology, there's an easier way to chart out methods and approaches to that in ways that haven't received representation in at least in these spaces and in terms of analog gaming. But that's a really excellent point in question. I wanted to draw a parallel with through feminist game research. We're almost out of time. I do want to, if anyone else would love, like to reply to that, um, great. Maybe what I'll just do is pose the last question and then I can give each of you kind of 30 seconds to reply to whichever of the two you want, say a couple final words, whatever um, is on your mind. Um, that's all right. Um, the last question, uh, which was in the chat was from Mana. When is it a good time to put digital element into your work. Um, like if you have a, a, a piece of uh, work, which is literature or um, non-digital, when um, when do you incorporate digital elements? One might say also gaming elements into the work. And I wonder how Shanmu in particular thinks about the gaming element and what it lifts up or adds to the presentation of the literature in this online um, or digital format. Um, so I'll leave you, starts 12.59. So we'll have sort of quick responses and then we'll wrap. Um, I would, oh, sorry, I'm just, I'm just going first, okay. 
um i would say that it's a it's just not only gaming elements i use it's a combination of uh, many other things are also along with the game elements but it's also the based on the need and also based on the audience because i my plan is to um attract school students that's why i used a simple game gaming elements so i think i would suggest uh, first of all what is the research output and who are your audience audiences so based on that i think we can go ahead incorporating all those um, gaming elements or non digital gaming elements into the into literature christine Oh, do I have a specific reply to that? I guess when it is like, I might, <laughs> it's like, or if you just everything. like to sort of synthesize and wrap up, wrap up your remarks, that's fine yeah. as well. I think I, I do kind of a, 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 well, maybe it's not a reply to that. I guess like my, my wrapping up remarks, well, thank you so much for organizing this space. And uh, I always love the opportunity to discuss like leisure and player cultures because it's like always exists in the continuum in the like the work that you have performed and other people have performed to create these leisure spaces. And in this pressing time, as some of the kids online are calling it's hot strike summer, even as the summer comes to a close, please, as we consider all these uh, labor and leisure technologies, uh, keep in mind all the people currently organizing to have humane conditions uh, to produce these spaces and technologies and cultural texts of leisure happening right now. And please do not throw the people who work so you can play under the bus when you talk about a uh, labor in both your public and private life. I just want to... Here, here. And I guess I would just conclude with like the question about where do you integrate digital things? I mean, I think the I think ask keep asking that question like constantly ask that question and let the answer be no sometimes like never like I, I maybe sometimes it's not the right tool for the job as I was sort of saying in my little talk and I think that's where um yeah I think that that's sort of the direction that I was trying to drive at is just this question of like if you're going to use a data visualization wall like don't just use it because it's there or don't just build it so that it is there and then people use it like genuinely ask the question about the labor involved about the environmental impact involved about the, the 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 material cost could those resources be funneled elsewhere into perhaps more mundane less sexy but more impactful things um and that applies in in game studies as much as it does in uh, in digital humanities thank you so much uh to to our three speakers. We're sadly out of time here, um, but Phelan, Christine, and Sean Mu, thanks so much um, for all of you who joined us in this virtual event. Really interesting conversation. Please check the chat. We have an event feedback form link, which will be really helpful in ensuring that the future lightning lunches um, are interesting and valuable to you, as well as information about our next event, our, our next uh, lightning lunch on digital archives, which is in person on Monday, October 16th. And our first visiting speaker, Jacqueline Wernemont, on Thursday, October 5th. Um, also um, in person. And there's a link there for you to register. So thank you so much. You've really given us a lot to think about as far as really the, what is the purpose of play, but also what is our purpose in the way that we study play. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you. Enjoy the rest of your day, folks. Take care. <laughs>